Good evening, I'm Pastor Luther from Incarnation Lutheran Church, and we are delighted to have you with us here for our Thursday evening devotions. Hope that you'll check out our website, godamong.us, G-O-D-A-M-O-N-G.us, and click on the ILC online activities because we have a lot of resources there for you that are designed to help you keep your faith life strong at a time when things are kind of out of whack. We've uh, been separated from each other, we're apart from each other, and probably will be for a bit of time yet. Um, and we, even when we do get back together, it's going to be weird for a bit. So please do keep your spiritual life strong. Stay in the habit of staying at church. And all of it's there for you. It's there for you now. And if you happen to have a need beyond what we have in the resources online, call us. We're here for you and we want to help. Um, this evening's devotion, I'm going to continue with the same sort of thing I've been doing, where I've been looking at the nuances of the Greek language, particularly, uh, with respect to how our understanding certain concepts might deepen our knowledge of a text and deepen our faithful response to God's word. Tonight I want to look at Luke chapter 23 verses 32 to 43. Now this is quite a long text, but Luke 23, 32 to 43 is the story of uh, Jesus' crucifixion actually and the forgiveness that he offers to the, the criminal who is on the cross beside him. I think that we really don't get how profound that forgiveness is until you understand the way it's written in Greek. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean in just a moment. But I'm going to read now from Luke 23, verses 32 to 43, and I'm reading from the NRSV. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When, did they, came, when they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, all of that seems pretty clear, and we seem to have a sense of understanding it, but I want to talk once again about the tense and aspect of verbs, because it makes a difference in how we understand what's going on here. Now, the first, I guess, way of looking at this is to look at this as a reporting of a, of a huge, epic piece of history that... Luke, who is a very good writer, by the way, wants us to stand back and see the whole big picture. He wants to give us a, a panoramic kind of sense of what's going on there. And so certain words are used, and the way in which those words are used really inform how we understand. Uh, and the tense that is used is errorist, and the aspect is perfect. The, the perfective errorist indicates a particular kind of perspective, if you like, that we are standing back from the whole business, able to see the whole big picture, and we get a sense of it as if we're on the outside looking in. Now, that's important because there are other times when we, we look at a matter, it's not looking from afar, but we're up close and personal. But in this instance, for most of what is being said, what you see in terms of the verbs is perfective errorist. Now, errorist, as I've said in previous occasions, um, and I, I almost want to apologize for using words like that because this implies that I'm teaching you Greek grammar and I, I sort of don't mean to do that. But in order for you to get the devotional sense of what's going on here, you need to hear this. It's aorist and it's perfect. And that means that we have this bigger, bigger broader perspective. So when you see words like uh, they, there they came and there they crucified Jesus, they came. That word is perfective aorist. So we're standing back and we're seeing what's going on. It goes on to say, they crucified. 
perfective errors. Again, we're standing back and looking at what's going on. They cast lots for his clothes. They mocked him. All of those verbs are perfective errors. And once again, puts us as spectators seeing this huge epic event and how it's going. But then we get into this phrase that Jesus utters. The, 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 the verse, let me just read the verse to you again so you can see it. Now, it's totally disguised in English. We can't see it. It says, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they were doing. Well, the truth of the matter is that the word that is used there is elegem, which means said. Now, that can have three different senses. Elegem, lego um, is, it means to speak or to say, and it's the past tense, the aorist. So it can be translated in three different ways, um, as a simple aorist, as, a, as an iterative aorist, and a third way, which I'm going to propose in a moment. So it could mean Jesus said, and that's the way it's translated here in the NRSV, or it could mean Jesus kept on saying, because there's a sense in which the imperfect uh, kind of notion here makes us believe that it's it's an ongoing sort of thing. So it's, it's a repetitive or uh, iterative errorist. In other words, it describes an action that continues. So Jesus said could be interpreted as Jesus kept on saying, but that makes no sense to the text that we're talking about here. Jesus made a statement. He said something. So um, a better interpretation of the way in which this errorist appears is what we call sometimes a dramatic errorist or an emphatic errorist, where the use of that particular tense with an imperfect aspect, the use of that particular tense indicates emphasis. It in indicates a dramatic sort of emphasis. So Jesus said with conviction, or Jesus said powerfully, or Jesus said almost like an exclamation. The saying was, Father, forgive them. So it's not just in a weak-voiced way, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, or in an insincere way, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, but with emphasis, with drama, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. The use of that kind of errorist, the emphatic errorist in this imperfect aspect changes the way that we look at this. So Jesus' prayer to the Father is huge. It's emphatic. It's not just a gentle request with his dying voice, but it was emphatic. Father, forgive them. Now, this dramatic errorist appears once again when the person who was with him hanging on the cross says, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Then he said, Elegane, once again, appears this dramatic errorist. And so it's as if he's saying, Jesus, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. It puts an emphasis on the action that follows. Jesus prays, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. It's not a little thing. It's a huge thing. The forgiveness is huge when it comes to that which comes from Jesus. And the humility with which the criminal who's dying says, Father, forgive them. Or, or rather, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It adds profundity and depth to the meaning of the expressions. In Jesus' case, the request for forgiveness for the people who are crucifying him. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And the humble request of the criminal dying alongside Jesus when he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In English, we don't see the emphasis. We don't see the drama. We don't see the importance of those concepts. We can gloss over them as if they're nothing, but more important than anything else to Jesus at that moment in time was to pray for this forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Imagine for a moment in your life, in any of our lives, the things for which we are guilty, the things of which we have been declared to be guilty or perhaps has been hidden, whatever the case may be, there is shame. 
There is horror at being discovered. And there's sometimes a sense of, I can never be forgiven for this. But Jesus, with his dying breath, says with emphasis, not just as a passing thought, but says with emphasis, which underscores the importance of God's love for us, the importance of Jesus' capacity to forgive us. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. That ought to give us a real sense of comfort more deeply than perhaps ever before, simply in looking at the tense of this verb because it underscores how important this forgiveness that Jesus offers to us is to Jesus and therefore should be to us. Irrespective of what your situation is, brothers and sisters, irrespective of how sinful you have been, the forgiveness that is offered to you is real. It is emphatic. It is important. And my prayer is that with the criminal hanging beside Jesus, we can all humbly say, Jesus, please, please, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's how real the forgiveness is. And that's how real our repentance ought to be. So brothers and sisters, join me in a word of prayer as we seek to be the kind of people who receive the forgiveness, that emphatic forgiveness that Jesus offers us. Let's pray. Good and gracious Lord, there are moments in life when we feel that we are altogether unforgivable. We don't do what we're supposed to do. We don't behave in the way that we're supposed to behave. And, and quite frankly, if we don't get caught, we don't even mention it. But Lord, we know the magnitude of our guilt. We know our shame. We know our sinfulness. But with the text that we see tonight and your forgiveness of the man crucified beside you on the cross, we hear something of the importance of your emphasis of forgiveness. When you say, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing, you say that for us too. And so it is our prayer, Lord, that we can be people who are as humble as was that criminal and say to you, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for joining us. We are glad that you came. We hope that you'll join us again on uh, for devotions again on Friday and Saturday evening and then for worship on Sunday morning. This coming week we have uh, a special service on Wednesday morning. Rather than the, the Bible reading that we send out at 6 a.m. every morning, we're going to be sending out the the Ash Wednesday service. And we hope that you've all gotten your your little stickers. Uh, Deacon Mindy has a sign-up thing online and, and you can access that there. Uh, make sure that you get it. It's, it's a, an ash cross. You know how we normally mark the cross on your forehead? We can't very well do that easily. So we want to encourage you to get these little stickers that you can affix to your shirt and wear them all day long so that people who happen to see you in whatever context you're in, whether you're at home or whether you have to travel somewhere to the grocery store, people will see that you're marked with the sign of the cross. So it says loud and clear that you remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. That's next Wednesday morning. But beyond that, we look forward to seeing you at worship on Sunday morning at 10. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and we look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.